again, everyone, and we will begin our meditation with uh, prayer. Lord Jesus, there's so many things right now in the world that are reasons why people disagree and fight and argue and are divided. And a few reasons that people feel they can truly come together and be one. That we know above all things, you have come to unite us under your grace. And so we pray for a unity of spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit to, to make us truly united in thought and in mind and in action. For the sake of your kingdom and because of your love for this world in which we live. In 1961, an aspiring children's author named Dr. Seuss wrote a bedtime story for kids about a group of yellow birds that I thought is perhaps, I can't think of a better way to introduce this topic that the Apostle Paul brings up in Galatians this morning than to actually just read to you from Dr. Seuss. So I'm not going to read the whole story, but I want to introduce with Sneetches by Dr. Seuss. So bear with me here. Now the star belly sneeches had bellies with stars. The plain belly sneeches had none upon dars. Those stars weren't so big, they were really so small. You might think such a thing wouldn't matter at all. But because they had stars, all the star belly sneeches would brag, we're the best kind of sneech on the beaches. With their snoots in the air, they would sniff and they'd snort. We'll have nothing to do with the plain belly sort. And whenever they met some, when they were out walking, they'd hike right on past them without even talking. When the star children went out to play ball, could a plain belly get in the game? Not at all. You could only play if your bellies had stars, and the plain children had none upon ours. When the star belly sneeches had Frankfurter roasts, or picnics, or parties, or marshmallow toasts, they never invited the plain belly sneeches. They left them out cold in the dark of the beaches. They kept them away, never let them come near, and that's how they treated them year after year. You'll have to get the book to read the rest of the story. Now, of course, this is just the beginning of a children's story that satirizes the way that people look at differences in society and, and shows how insufficient they are to exclude to discriminate, to look down on people, to cause all those kinds of social harms when we push people away, whether it's discrimination or racism or ageism or classism or ableism or sexism or whatever other ism you might think of. Because the difference between the Sneetches was so superficial and small, just a green little star on their bellies, that they all became victims of a con job, that's what the rest of the story is about, when a business tycoon named Sylvester McMonkey McBean shows up with his fancy machine that can put the stars on or take the stars off and he takes away all their money just so that they could keep those distinctions the way they wanted. Now real life can be a lot more complicated, as you all know. The differences and disagreements that people have lead us into an ever fragmented society, one that has groups or cliques, whether it's at work or at school, whether it's with people you hang out with around your neighborhood, or whether it's that echo chamber that people talk about when we only want to listen to or talk to people whom we already agree with or who already share our views or vote like us or think like us or live with the same lifestyle as us, that we can see happening, and even more so right now with COVID and elections happening and all of that. But this was also the same in the age that we have this book, Galatians, written. People were dividing themselves into their own little factions. We had the Jews forming one group within, Christ within Christianity and the Gentiles being another. The Jews the nation of Israel, as you well know, they separated themselves from the others because they had a set of laws that they viewed from God, from Moses, that existed for the purpose of acting like a hedge, of separating themselves from the other nations so that they could remain pure 
and eventually the Messiah would come from them. Now, in, in our series we've been talking about, the whole point is that we have been saved by grace, by grace alone. And living under grace, as we're calling this series this month, Jesus showed us a few weeks ago that through baptism, under grace, we have something that unites us that in a way should take away those differences and distinctions so that we all stand equal before God. And on paper, that is very much what Christianity teaches, and that's very much what the Christian church is on paper in the Bible. But in the early church, that got put to the test. In fact, the God wanted the people to, he wanted the people, the early Christians, to see from himself very clearly that this is how it's supposed to be, that we are one church united in Christ. So in the book of Acts, chapter 10, God gave the apostle Peter a triple vision of seeing this bedsheet, if you will, filled with unclean animals as a way of showing Peter that he could now have fellowship with those who weren't Jews, with the, with the Gentiles around him. And to reinforce that, the early Christians had a special meeting in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 in which they distinctly said, Jews and Gentiles we are all saved by grace. We are all united under Christ. No group is better than the other. We are all one. So on paper, everything should be great. But just like those star-bellied sneeches were looking down on the plain belly sort, the Jewish Christians didn't always live this out so perfectly. And it came to a head in Galatians chapter 2, in the church in Antioch, where Paul actually had to call out Peter and the other Christians who weren't following this principle. This is what Paul wrote. When Cephas, so Cephas is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived... He began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then? that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. So the Apostle Peter, sometimes called Cephas, or by his Jewish name Simon, all three the same guy, was absolutely one of the pillars of the Christian church, as Paul calls him in the verses just before our text. And Peter was very involved in that meeting in Jerusalem in Acts 15, when everyone agreed, yes, we Jews and we Gentiles we are all alike. We are all the same. And even James was there, who also is mentioned. But even though they all agreed with that, getting along became a trickier thing when Peter and the other Jews began to realize that by accepting the Gentiles, that meant at times they might have to give up some of their Jewish customs. Customs that they had practiced their whole life, customs that they felt were absolutely important in following God, even as Christians. And they weren't exactly comfortable doing that. So much so that, that we hear in our text that a group of them came from Jerusalem to Antioch, where Paul was serving as a pastor, and they demanded... They demanded that everyone else should follow those Jewish customs, even the Gentiles. And if people didn't do it, then that would mean they're not really Christians. They aren't really followers of Jesus unless they are living like Jews. Paul says that, that even Peter, even though he was a pillar in the church, joined in this thinking. He joined in socially shunning the Gentile Christians, the people who weren't, believe, who weren't following these things. And like those 
plain belly sneeches, they left them out. They pushed them away and began to exclude them from participating in their fellowship because they weren't good enough if they weren't following those customs. And so suddenly Paul finds himself in this super awkward position. If he doesn't speak up, then it means he's going along with what Peter and the others were doing. And that would be by far the easiest thing to do because if he stands up, well, that, that can be super uncomfortable and awkward to have to point out to someone, you're messing up Christianity here. See, because Paul understood this situation rightly. What Peter and the other Jews were saying to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles, to the Greeks and Romans, is that if you aren't acting like us, if you aren't living with our customs, then you aren't really a Christian. You aren't really a follower of Jesus. Now, just to put some context on how awkward that would be for Paul to stand up and confront Peter, the best parallel I could think of was imagine if, if, if I had to do that, if President Schrader, the president of our whole church body, was guest preaching at our church today. And we had to call him out for a sin. That's not so easy to do. And it's super painful and awkward for everyone involved. But Paul knew that he couldn't keep quiet. He knew that he had to say something because the damage for not speaking up would be far, far worse. It would say to all the people who weren't acting like Jews, your faith in Jesus, that's not good enough. It's not sufficient enough. And even though going along would be the, the more, I guess, comfortable and easy thing to do, anytime that we say to people that their faith in Jesus isn't enough, that they also need something else, whatever it is, fill in the blank, you choose, that has a damaging effect. So whether that thing might be, I think people should share my political opinions, or I think people should share my taste for music or worship style, or uh, people should, should agree with me about my vision for the direction of the church, or people should eat the same food that I do or live the same lifestyle that I have. If any one of those things becomes the basis for someone being accepted as a Christian, that has a very potential, potentially damaging effect by changing the equation of grace from being God saves us by Jesus to God saves us by Jesus plus whatever I think it might be. And for what? Just because, just because I think people should be more comfortable with my views and live the way I want them to? There is also something else going on here in this text, in this story that we have from Galatians chapter 2. And it seems like everybody else who was there understood that what Peter was doing was wrong as well. Even though none of them were really speaking up and they were all just sort of going along with it because after all, it's Peter. He's the leader of the church. And it's a lot easier to be quiet and to stay comfortable than it is to, be, to speak up in an awkward and painful way. And that's why this text has been paired with our gospel lesson today where Jesus says, when your brother or sister sins, go and speak to that person. Now Paul had to do that in a very public way because what Peter was doing was happening in front of everyone. There was no hiding that what Peter was doing. Everyone saw and understood what this meant. But it's for this same reason that Paul does speak up. Because he understands that what's more important is to save Peter and to save the others who are being deceived by this lie that you had to be more than just, have more than just faith in Jesus, you also had to live like a Jew. But it also points out that love, the love to speak up when someone else is tripped up by a sin, well, that's not a very comfortable thing to do. In fact, it's almost always painful and awkward and never something that we enjoy doing. Just think about how often that happens in the church. How often, when was the last time any of us went up to another Christian brother or sister and said, you know, I'm not so sure what you're doing with your life right now is in line with God's word. It doesn't happen too often. 
Because it's a lot easier for us to just say, you know, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to make things awkward. Paul gives a warning, though, to Peter. And he gives a warning to us as well, who, grow, who give up on being saved by grace for the sake of comfort. Our own personal comfort or this, that avoiding social awkwardness when he, when he says these words to us in Galatians. I'm not going to read all of them again, but I'll read the, the ones that really speak up. When I, he says to Peter, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is a rather uncomfortable thing Paul had to point out to Peter in front of the whole congregation, even though he was the apostle and a pillar in the church. And how much more so for those of us who don't have the luxury, like Peter did, of walking and living and and learning directly from Jesus himself. If Peter can fall into a sin like that, Paul is pointing out to us how much more we have the need to be ready to speak up when it's necessary, and even when it might be uncomfortable. But we're also reminded, as, Peter, as Paul points out to us here, the cross that Jesus died on, that wasn't exactly comfortable either. Carrying the burden of the sin of the world, my sin and your sin included, that's just not a very comfortable thing to even think about. And it wasn't a pleasant experience for Jesus at all. But what we see instead through Paul is that grace and speaking about forgiveness and peace and unity can often be messy and even uncomfortable work. To point out to people that, that Jesus loves us all equally as God's children and that all these other things that we like to divide ourselves with don't really matter, that can be messy work. And that can even make us feel rather uncomfortable at times. Because whatever I consider to be important, whatever I place next to the cross, when I place it there and, and compare it to what Jesus has done, things that I think are important are absolutely meaningless. That's just how they are. Now in Dr. Seuss's book about the Sneetches here, the Sneetches only get to be friends at the end once they realize that all their money is gone and that Sylvester McMonkey McBean can't take another dime from them or change anything. And so they, they don't really even know who has stars and who, doesn't has, who, who didn't have stars to begin with anymore. Maybe they could have all just bought t-shirts and that would have solved the problem too. But what Paul points out is that in Christ we have something even greater at work. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Baptized, washed clean in Christ, forgiven of all of our sins, we recognize that we have something far greater that is at work in us to unite us than the things that might separate us. For in the body of Christ, this is really important for us to keep in mind all the time and necessary for us to keep in mind just because when we look around and recognize we're very different on the outside. There's a lot of things that, that could separate us. In Christ, they no longer have to. Instead, we look at the things that, that might be differences as blessings that make us each unique 
as a part of the body of Christ, each a different member who makes that body work. And I think it's really cool that we can look around our congregation and see just how varied and, and diverse we are in all of our different ways. For in our one congregation, the ministry we have going on, whether it's in Vancouver or Surrey or Coquitlam, we have all the different kinds of people. We have people who are lifelong Christians. And we have people who are still trying to figure out if Christianity is true. We have people who are native-born Vancouverites and people who just arrived here a few weeks ago, a few months ago. We have people from all sorts of different countries and cultures and backgrounds and contexts. We have people who are Canadians and can vote and people who are immigrants and just trying to make a way. We have people who work in white-collar jobs for a salary and people who work the night shift in a blue-collar way. We have people who are going to school and people who have, are working on their PhD. We have people who love, who love the music that, uh, that I'm playing on the internet here and other people who prefer if we listen to classical or orchestral music. We have people who support the conservative party and people who support the liberal party and the NDP party. We have people who, who look at uh, who, who look at Christianity and, and can understand and teach it from a whole number of levels and can, can explain the Bible and people who are trying to figure out just the table of contents or how to look up a verse in the Bible. We have people who speak English and people who are learning English. We have people who, are, who still read Dr. Seuss as one of their favorite authors, perhaps, and others who remember growing up with Dr. Seuss long ago. I could go on and on, but you get the point that there's so much different about us, and yet we find this reason to come together in Christ. And what we have together in Christ is far greater, far more powerful. The reasons that we might disagree look a little bit silly, like those stars on the Sneetches, when we recognize that in Jesus, the sin that divides us, the differences that keep us apart, those things go away when we sit and recognize the grace that unites us. We are one in Christ our brother.